I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. Today is uh, Thursday, September 15th, 2022. Uh, I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along. Today is the day we hang out with companions. I call it the Companion Show. It's friends. And uh, we talk about whatever is on our mind uh, and hopefully have meaningful, purposeful, uh, intentional examinations of thoughts, ideas, trends, uh, expectations that we have of each other and of the world. We talk about uh, our obligation to be stewards of existence and co-authors of uh, futures in which we win. Let me begin by bringing on my co-host, uh, my friend, uh, my kindergarten classmate, Brenda Lyle Gray, who joins me every day from New Mexico. Brenda, how are you doing? I'm fine. And again, happy birthday. Well, thank you, thank you. You know, Boss got... and I kind of liked our Stevie Wonder. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. You guys are great uh, in doing that. Reminds me, I've got to call up uh, your best friend and my friend Brenda Isom. Uh, and uh, Brenda Isom and I were born minutes apart in the same hospital, Kansas Kansas University Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. And I've written about this that uh, we lived in Missouri, but our parents drove to Kansas to give birth because uh, there was higher quality care in Kansas City, Kansas at the University of Kansas Medical Center and, uh, and not at General Hospital, uh, which was like the default location for indigent uh, people in Kansas City, Missouri. Some years later, the entire process of uh, accommodations opened up with the advent of desegregation and uh, laws regarding public accommodations. But we went through those processes in the uh, the late 40s and 50s. And you and I, Brenda, uh, talk about, uh, I think yesterday you were mentioning, uh, uh, talking about Fairyland Park, for example, when we were in high school or junior high, I think, uh, our classes decided to not go or to walk out or to protest the fact that they only allowed uh, one day a year that black students could come to this public uh, amusement park, kind of like the one we have here in Minnesota now called Valley Fair, or people in other markets may have Six Flags over Texas, things like that. And uh, things were so segregated and so uh, normalized in their segregation that it seemed that people just accepted that it was okay for us to have an experience in recreation and community one day a year. Well, obviously it's not acceptable. We as students, I think in seventh grade or eighth grade protested uh, and decided to not go or walked out. And uh, that's been kind of our path from that point on. Even before that, protesting injustice. And here we stand, Brenda Lyle Gray, uh, 50 years later or more, uh, at the age of 75 for me, today's my birthday. But now we have another surprise for you. Oh, go right ahead. <laughs> okay. 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 Vash, are you re are you ready for the companion? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we thought that for Thursday, no matter who came on, mm -hmm. that you always talk about him mm -hmm. and we were hoping Burnell would be here and he might pop in. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew that it had been a while since you had seen the memorial mm -hmm. and we just thought it would be so appropriate for his spirit to say to you, happy birthday, cousin. Oh, well, wow. amazing. That's wonderful. So this is my cousin, and uh, he was a twin, but from my point of view, we were triplets. Bernard Powell, Burnell Powell, who's regularly on here with us on Thursdays, and me. And the two of these guys were six months older than me. Uh, I hung out with them. They were both my friends, uh, my protectors, and my idols, uh, and uh, they remain so. But Bernard was a phenomenal, phenomenal human being, unfortunately murdered, uh, shot in the head at point blank at the age of 33 at a 
a nightclub uh, in our neighborhood. And as I understand it, it was after an activity uh, when he was out on the campaign trail. He had wanted uh, to um, run for state Senate. Well, we'll come back and talk more about that. But uh, the beautiful thing, and thank you for bringing this up, Brenda, is that uh, our family, his family and, and ours cousins all under the direction of my mother, Maxine McFarland, uh, uh, took on this vision that they brought into reality in creating a monument to recognize and commemorate the work of Bernard Powell. And it's across the street from the house we lived in. We called it the Powell House, it was 2801 and 2803 Brooklyn. Uh, that house is still owned by Bernard's youngest, young sister, only sister, Teola Powell. She still lives there. And uh, the fact that uh, my mother and all of us have the presence of mind, but primarily my mother, to say that we owe it to history and posterity to acknowledge our own and to build a monument that reflects uh, and lets the world know that we passed this way. And I'm grateful to Bernard for who he was and what he was, what he did. And to my mom, Maxine McFarland, call her Queen Mother McFarland, for having the uh, audacity to demand that the world stop and take note that uh, our lives matter. I think my colleague, Dr. Irma, is here. There she is. There Dr. She Irma, is. how you doing? How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. And Feliz Cuclianos to you. Happy birthday, Al. Mil gracias. Mil gracias. Thank you so much. So good <laughs> to see you. Congratulations <laughs> to you, too, on today. Yes, yes. <laughs> I sent her a congratulations note. I think it's so great. <laughs> because well, wonder, her, her career is so yeah. phenomenal. <laughs> well, actually, I wanted to spend the day focusing on Irma, you know, ah. and on her and her work, and particularly because she's in town today, among other things, for a commemoration of uh, her work, her role in the creation of the University of Minnesota's North Minneapolis campus project called the Center for Urban uh, uh uh, Urban Research, at, Urban yes, research and, and, and Outreach, outreach right? engagement, engagement, engagement Center. Yes. That's, uh, I got tied it's a mouthful. To <laughs> yeah. But it's a, a wonderful facility and a uh, another example of a vision being brought into brick and mortar. Uh, yes. Something that stands there that's useful, that's practical, and that is a testament to our people, our needs, and our future. So let me ask you, Irma, just to talk about uh, how you came to Minnesota. I know you've been here before, you have family here, but how you came into this project and where our community was and what the community uh, gained from the redevelopment of what had been the uh, Plymouth Avenue Shopping Center, pretty yes. much uh, uh, broken down, uh, unused, unoccupied, abandoned, and uh, repurposed and rebuilt. So talk about that. Well, uh, I came at the end of 2007, and I would say, first, I'd already been in Minnesota at the Science Museum of Minnesota because the race exhibit, Race Are We So Different, which was a public education museum exhibit that was built by the Science Museum of Minnesota, launched in January of 2007. Little did I know that a few months later, or by the end of the year, that I would actually be, be back in Minnesota, uh, in Minneapolis, working for the University of Minnesota. Uh, my, my, my hire as the founding executive director and also an associate vice president was the consolation prize. I actually applied for the position as associate vice president of public engagement. Mm -hmm. And they hired Andy Furco, who I understand has now stepped down to go back to being full-time faculty. And they, the search committee decided that they wanted both of us. And I was tasked with bringing this, what they called an urban agenda at that moment. And I tried to persuade them to move to an urban vision to, to make it into a reality. As I understand it, uh, the community and the university had been talking for about two and a half years. And out of that, they had formed what became known as the University Northside Partnership. And as, as the story goes, and again, I'm, I'm sort of telling urban legends, but as I was told, the community finally just said to the university, okay, this is very nice. I think it was about 14 nonprofits that included like the Phyllis Wheatley, uh, the alternative school that Bill English was part of, 
um, and a number of other organizations, nonprofits, that they would partner with the university, but they had a lot of concerns. And I think the major one is that the community in North Minneapolis felt that it had been abandoned by the university, that there used to be many activities that were university uh, developed in the community, and then they just kind of disappeared with no explanation. Uh, the community also felt that the university uh, scholars would come over, do research, go off, get their PhDs, or write another article, but the direct benefit to the community was not evident in that work. So there was a lot of tension and you had this, this structure of a UNP and they challenged university. Okay, so we have this partnership, now what are you gonna do? And I think it's really important for people to understand that the catalyst for this was on the one hand, the university was getting wanting to hire a top-notch scientist named Dante Cicchetti, who is at the U, who did this research around uh, working with people, neurological uh, assessments around violence and trauma and helping people to, um, you know, to sort of navigate that, that those kinds of issues and also working with parents around out of home placement. And at that time, North Minneapolis had the highest uh, incident of out of home placements of children who were taken out of their home and put into foster care that was disproportionate to the percent of the population. Uh, that the black community, which North Minneapolis, mostly African-Americans represented. And so there were all these concerns. People were concerned that they were gonna be a laboratory. And so they, they, they picketed, as I understand, and you probably know a little bit more of this story than I do, but they basically challenged the institution. And so the university purchased uh, the, the shopping center at the corner of Plymouth uh, across from the Urban League and said they would do something and they said okay you have the building now what are you going to do and so uh my applying for the position of associate vp for public engagement um i sort of got the default but for me it was the best it was the best consolation prize because i got to to be an anthropologist i had one foot in the community and one foot in the university and i was able to use a lot of the tools that i had actually that I, I, I have with me as an anthropologist, going into the community, doing field work, listening to community concerns, and then trying to figure out how to incorporate that into translating this idea, this vision into a reality. I also did some background research. I contacted uh, Penn State, which has a university community partnership. Penn sits, um, right on the intersection of a, they're actually in the community. Mm -hmm. And so they had developed a project of working with the schools and putting people, support people in the schools. They actually created businesses where they, they, they felt that there was no industry, just like North Minneapolis, there was no industry. And so what they did was to say, we have laundry, we have a med school, we have dorms. And so why don't we create a laundry business and have the community run it? And mm. so they were figuring out ways in which they could leverage their privilege and help be of a benefit to the community. I also contacted the University of South Florida. And the question that I asked both of them was, if in, in retrospect, what would you do different? What was successful? And I tried to sort of utilize that and incorporate that into the work that I was doing. And clearly the community played a major role Mm -hmm. uh, pe some of the people who were the strongest opposition are 13 years later, some of my best buds when I come to Minneapolis. Sure. You know, but we had to work through those tensions. Uh, people wanted a com community benefits agreement. And I had to explain that the university is a land grant educational institution. It is not a, develop a developer. And so it can't enter into a CBA. However, what is it that we want that, that a CBA would accomplish. And let's see if we can find another way to do it, but without having that kind of formal structure to it. And I, I think that if you look at the programming uh, that UROC started out with, uh, the broadband access uh, mm -hmm. grant that we received, which actually the idea came from you mm -hmm. uh, and the Multicultural Media Consortium, 
uh, to get that ARA grant for $2.8 million. And then the university put in $770,000. And we ended up with about a two-year grant of $3.2 million uh, to support community-based uh, broadband access, expanding the facilities of, of community organizations that were doing uh, tech you know, trying to expand their their constituencies' uh, access to broadband, right. and also it had job creation. Uh, and then we were able to subcontract with the newspapers to mm -hmm. tell the stories. And so the idea was that the money that came in should go directly back into the the community. And that was a unique thing because most colleges and universities have a negotiated rate of federal grants where they can take up to 50 percent of the grant mm -hmm. you know as part of their negotiated rate and what happened under this grant is that the university not only did not take anything they put it all back into the program but they also contributed not just in kind but actual money yeah seven hundred thousand dollars it was a big yes. program yes. i want to come back and talk about that but before we get into that uh, I'd love for you to reflect on sort of uh, being dual track in developing the UROC. Number one, you became a um, a actually building developer, real estate yes. person. <laughs> and that might have been a new arena for you, but how did that take place? And while you were doing that, you were also conceptualizing the offering, the mission, the programmatic uh, direction of the university's presence in the community. So how did you approach both things, manage them both? and have them uh, merge into a reality that is still bearing fruit in our community? Well, first, I, I have to give props. You know, I was in on the process to identify the architects and uh, Urban Design partnered with Chuck Levine, and they're actually going to be at the, the program today. And oh, they take assembled. A minute. What's, what's the program today? Let's tell people about it. So, what's so, today. so today at four o'clock, there is so so there's an open house. So today is Community Day at UROC. This is the 13th Community Day, and it's an open house, so people can come and learn about what goes on in the building, uh, in the facility, because. In addition to UROC, there are other programs. Extension has a program. The School of Education has a program. I think there's like a, an urban um, forestry program. Uh, there are lots of different programs and they come in and out. They come with their own funding and only if they have a community partner in North Minneapolis are mm -hmm. they able to use that space. Mm -hmm. So it is dedicated space to facilitate university community partnerships. It's not just free space for anyone. And so there are a lot of research programs going on. Uh, and at the time, we were literally starting, when that building opened, we literally had to build the operations from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So starting with the architectural design, the first thing we had to explain to both the architects and later the construction company was that the community was going to have an input into what was happening. And that was new for everyone, but people were very open to it. And so the initial designs were presented to the universe, to, to the community. And I would say the one that had the most impact was, um, was the one called, you can find it on SlideShare, it's called Imagining Art and the New Landscape. And what we did was to hold a brainstorming session at the fourth precinct, which is right next door to UROC. And we mm -hmm. use their, they have a community room because UROC was now under construction. Uh, it had asbestos, so it had to be, they had to, to manage that. And so we, we held it close to the building, uh, but we had people brainstorm, what do you wanna see in it? And I think the most significant thing is that the architects heard the community. Uh, you had Setu Jones, uh, and Bob Close, of land, he's an environmental landscaper, and Setu Jones is a public artist. And they brought in models of the building, and they had various tables with different mo with models where people could brainstorm, what do you want to see on the outside? What do you want to see on the inside? And those ideas, the architectural team actually incorporated into it. So, for example, the building itself is what was called a suburban model. It was a recessed building with a big surface lot, like you see in Target, right? right. The building right. sits back, and then you've yep. got all this parking space. Yep. 
based on what the community said, which is how do you got to get people to come into the building if they don't have a reason to be there? What's going to bring them in? And two things happened. One, they tore up that surface lot, made it into an arc, reclaimed green space in the front, and basically created a pathway that invited people to kind of come look at the building. The second thing is that the reception area in Rock is an art gallery. Mm -hmm. And so people didn't have to come there to have business. They could come there to use the art, get to, to just see the art that was in there. The module of furniture, which, you know, I selected was movable furniture. So you could move it out of the way and you could, uh, people could come in and move the chairs down at one end. We put in a coffee clash so that people could come in. There was a senior citizen's home within walking distance. They could come in look at the art and have a cup of coffee and then walk back. And so there were lots of ways in which we, we tried to make this something that was exciting. The other thing was that in, in, the, in the architectural design, one of the, um, I would say, missions that I gave the architects was that the back of the building was as important as the front because the back of the building faces the neighborhood. And at the time, in the original building, it was where the delivery took place. It was where the garbage truck cans were. And so the, the community was always looking at the back end of, of garbage cans and delivery trucks. What they did was to take that wall out. It is completely glass. And so they can look into the building and see the art exhibits, you know, without having to come in but it gives them a nice visual that is very different from what was happening in the beginning. Uh, just a new way of uh, being connected and having access and the feeling uh, that you're not by design excluded. Right. Uh, kept out of the place. Um, and it, 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 it also ahead. reflected transparency. Yeah. I mean, one of the po one of the points of this is that the community wanted to know what was going to happen. And when you can see inside, you know, it's like, how do we make the building itself reflective of the principles that we wanted to, to make part and parcel of this? You asked me how I came to sort of learn about, you know, architectural design and construction. Mm -hmm. As an anthropologist, I teach a segment called proxemics. And proxemics is about the idea that space has meaning. You know, physical space tells you a story. And so when I thought about you, Rock, and as I'm talking to the architects and we met like weekly for, you know, a couple of hours, I would ask myself, what do I want people to say about this building in 50 years? Or if the building is gone in 50 years and uh, a, a um, what would you call them? Uh, people who do archaeology. If an archaeology team comes and digs it up, sure. what is the space going to tell them about what was happening in that building? So I was thinking ahead in terms of 50 years from now. I'm thinking ahead about what is the physicality, the way that we design this building within the limitations, right? What is it that we can, what is the message? So the message is when you walk in, you have this wide reception area with art and you have a reception desk, you sign in, but there's material you can sit down. There are public computers. There's a public conference room that community can actually uh, sign up for, for their organizations. And we discovered it was actually two separate buildings. And so the footprint of one is where you find this great room that will hold 225 people. And mm -hmm. the furniture that was selected was furniture that could be uh, stacked and, and put away if you just needed it as open space, or it yeah. could be arranged. And that was on the east end of the building that yes. used to be King's the supermarket, store. grocery the store. Supermarket. Yeah. Yes, yes. But it was a space where uh, I believe that uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison, when he used to hold his faith his interfaith uh, conferences that he, once the building was open, he held it there. And so it was a space that was like, had multi-purposes mm -hmm. and there wasn't anything like it, you mm -hmm. know, in, in North Minneapolis at that time where you could have an event, you could have a conference, you could have, you know, any, any number of things, you know, happening there. And so I came with the idea that space tells us a story. 
And how you set up those spaces and how you organize it is going to tell us something. And it's going to communicate to the community uh, ideas and principles. And so very consciously and having someone like say too, who designed uh, the, the gallery, the way the gallery could host things. Uh, also, there was an interior design student. And what we discovered was that if you go into the bathrooms, the, the tile pattern in there is actually based on uh, some design, some textile designs. And we discovered that African textiles, some of the African textiles like kinti cloth and Laotian or Vietnamese textiles are actually very similar. And so those brick patterns, those tile patterns actually reflect not just randomness, but they're actually reflective of sort of some cultural ideas and things. And that was something that I think was we were also trying to to weave into that. How do we bring the cultures of the community into the building, into the the patterns, the colors that we chose, trying to make it not look institutional, but inviting to people to want to encourage them to come in, even if they didn't have a reason to be there. Go ahead, Brenda. You know, um, Dr. Irma, <clears throat> excuse me. I thought of this image. Well, it really wasn't an image. Al talked about it a lot. When he came down the street, he could look on one side at the Urban League and the windows were open. And then he looked on the other side and you could see the people in your rock and it was like, you know, it was happening. It was community and that I, I don't live there, but I could visualize it by the way he described his feelings about seeing people at work. Yes. Brenda, Brenda you and I are on exactly the same page um, and exactly the same thought. And that's the comment I was gonna make to put this conversation in context, uh, Dr. Irma. You know, for the longest time, so Plymouth Avenue in front of where Urock is was the center of urban rebellions in North Minneapolis yes. in the 1960s. And there are photographs in the Star Tribune archives of a phalanx of police officers standing and squaring off against black youth in North Minneapolis, black people, black families. And uh, a showdown was taking place uh, after the death of a black person in a grocery store uh, on Plymouth Avenue. And this was around the same time that the urban unrest was occurring uh, around the country, you know, behind the, the, the conflicts with uh, the uh, shooting of Dr. Murder of Dr. King. Yes, uh, and 1968, yes. In the years before that, but this was a, a cumulative uh, expression of frustration and anger and uh, a, a reaction against <laughs> the uh, a reaction <laughs> against the arrogance, the supremacist policy that restricted uh, the actual physical movement of Black people, but certainly tried to restrict the dreaming, the imagination, the expectations that we would have a, a right and responsibility, an opportunity to shape policy, to be part of the economy uh, and not just at the margin. And so, you know, that street went from a vibrant Jewish commercial district to a wasteland. Yes. And sat pretty much empty for almost 15, 20 years uh, until the shopping center and things like that came on. But those had tenuous, you know, uh, development histories and track records yes. as well because they were the right idea, the shopping center, uh, the bank across the street, some new housing on Plymouth Avenue, uh, east of where Urock is, a community center exactly east of Urock that was called The Way. Uh, the uh, Way yes. was a youth community center that was associated with, uh, known by the leadership of uh, people like Spike Moss, uh, yes. who was on the program a couple of days ago, uh, Sil uh, Davis and Gwen Jones Davis Pyle from Antioch University, uh, Mahmoud El Khadi. Uh, the former um, city council member for First Ward St. Paul, Bill Wilson, uh, a number of uh, intellectuals, activist leaders were associated with creating an alternative school 
and education process at the way. And that was also the center of the Black Panther type activity. Yes. Uh, and at one point in time, uh, the city moved to uh, demolish the building and set up in its place the fourth precinct. And from my point of view and the point of view of many residents, it was a willful uh, demonstration of power right. where you had uh, uh, conceived the possibility of the birth of, of and nurturing of revolutionary fever, fervor in your community, uh, a point out of which change would emanate, we, the institution, the government, the power, will plop our jail on top of your dreams. And so it was an assault and an affront. And that in part, Dr. Irma, that spirit and that suspicion was also one of the things that was afoot when the university announced that it was gonna create Europe or engage Dr. Cicchetti, who was renowned as a researcher uh, and the community said, oh, you know what, research us for what, who are you, you know, and what you're going to do with it. We have these fresh experiences with, uh, the way being demolished, destroyed and, uh, pushed to the margin and with it, not so much the building, but the suppression of the dreams and aspirations of the community. Now you want to study us again. We've been studied and studied and studied. And I, I've used this language, you all keep studying uh, in a way that you study our misery, we get to keep the misery, you get to keep the money. And and this seemed to be another exercise in, uh, in pimping our people. That's what you walked into and what you have to deal with is that suspicion and that history of lived experiences that was real. And you were able to successfully, I believe, navigate that and to connect, uh, educate, uh, not just us, but them as well, so that they understood uh, the role they had in creating this dysfunction. It wasn't dysfunction in and among Black people. It was us understanding what you have to do when you're in an alligator pit. You know, <laughs> you got to be careful. So, Doctor, go ahead. I, I think all of what you say is true, and it, it speaks to the fact that um, institutions that are, are adjacent or close in close proximity to vulnerable communities, underserved communities, have not always been good, good neighbors. And so they, it's been an extraction kind of process. And so what we were trying to do was to really shift that kind of dynamic. So monthly, there was a community affairs meeting where the community could come in and they could ask us any questions and they could tell us what was on their mind. Uh, what we could, what, you know, we couldn't resolve everything if people wanted some, if they had issues about social services. But what we could do is to leverage our privilege as an institution that was, because the city was also a partner, we could say to the city, hey, this issue came up in the community affairs meeting. So one of the things that happened is that, as you know, when, when you rock, when the university bought the building, it displaced some businesses. Some were small businesses that it was not problematic, but it displaced the supermarket. And from that, from that location to get to the cup food that was a few blocks away, people had to take like two buses. So one of the things that happened was that the university agreed to host a shuttle for a couple of years until something could be figured out about how people could get to a, you know, a supermarket. Now you'll see right outside of Europe, there's a set of bicycles, you know, those kind of rent -a bites that people mm -hmm. can have. Mm -hmm. And there are people who say that never would have happened if the university had not been there. But the point is, is that you, you know, there was an, you know, community engagement historically and public engagement had been about how can the university use the community to expand and enrich their, the, the educational experiences of their students. So one of the things that I said as a condition was that we weren't going to have a lot of students in and out. We had them as work study to like work on the reception desk. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, this was not going to be, um, you know, a laboratory. This mm -hmm. was really asking the community, what are your needs? Mm -hmm. And so we had to ask every program, give us a description of what you do. 
but don't give us the long version that you use for your research funders. Give us three things, three items that you can list that are a direct benefit to the community. And it was really hard for some of the researchers to do that because they weren't, they were so accustomed to, well, I have the grant, so I'm going to do this work, but not really articulating what is the benefit, the direct benefit to the community partners that you mm -hmm. have. And that began to set a tone for community organizations to start asking the questions themselves of researchers, uh, you know, of, of what, you know, are you following sort of the agenda that UROC has set in place? And I think that was important because it was about agency, that the community uh, partners had more agency than they historically thought that they, they had. I love the fact that you mentioned research and research is the name of the organization actually. Uh, and you spent a lot of time, I know that I'm one of the people, uh, Dr. Irma, that was both educated and impressed by your ability to explain the value of data-driven decision-making. You gave us, in my view, uh, and in my experience, the language, the tools to understand how that which we believed had been used against us could be used by us for us as a an agent or a tool for changing, improving uh, our situation, but also advancing what we perceive to be and present as our interest. And uh, I think that was really one of the, the major contributions because research like that continues today and our community has moved away from uh, a, a fear of the idea of research to an embrace of the technology, the strategy, uh, the importance, and also a sense of equity ownership that when research occurs in our community, uh, what does it mean to us and who owns the data, who owns the result, and how do we use that for freeing ourselves? Um, talk about that, about uh, about research. And again, the, the, the background then was fear of another white researcher coming in studying us, uh, even without our approval. The, 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 I mean, the thought was that they would be doing some kind of secretive research uh, on, our main, on our minds, our families, our children. And even though they told us something about it, we really wouldn't be getting the full story. Therefore, the safe thing is to shut it down, never let it launch. So there was that kind of really um, uh, hyper fear of the university and of research, you have to diffuse that through uh, education. Talk about that if you would. Well, I think one of the things that I think of is one was to demystify this idea of research, you know, who can do it, uh, who has control over it. And I like to use the metaphor of grandma's gumbo. Uh, well, before I get to that, one of the things that was always in my head was the statement of one of the people who participated in the anthropology research by John Gwaltney. John Gwaltney was a black anthropologist who was born blind and he, he studied under Margaret Mead and did his first book on river blindness. His second book is called Dry Longso. And it, 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 he went back to his own community to do this research. And one of the people that he talked to said, you know, this anthropology is just another way to call me the N word, you know? And so I'm always conscious that how we go about communicating with and explaining to people what research is, is important. And so I often use the metaphor is that all of us do research every day. Just think about grandma's gumbo. You go to the family reunion, you taste grandma's gumbo, and you decide you want to make it. What you embark upon is research. Mm -hmm. You start calling people around, seeing what the ingredients are. That's discovery. You start doing some testing, hypothesis testing. You, 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 you cook it this way, you cook it that way. Then you may have some people sample it just to see how close did you come to grandma's gumbo. So in our everyday life, we are continuously doing research, but we often compartmentalize it that that is the domain of people who have degrees and what we do in everyday life is something else when mm -hmm. it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. So one of the greatest achievements I think UROC did was uh, when we discovered, uh, when I came in and we started talking about the building, I would do a walkthrough. I just get up and walk the streets and, you know, we were handing out notices to say UROC is coming. 
And people would either think that I was trying to uh, proselytize and say, not interested. And I'd say, no, no, I'm from the university and this is gonna be coming into the community. But one of the things that I tried to do was to explain to people that they had a right uh, you know, to, well, one of the things that, that struck me was the mortgage foreclosure and how it had impacted the three zip codes that UROC is in. And 56% of all the mortgage foreclosures in the city of Minneapolis happened in three zip codes that were in North Minneapolis, 56% Black, Black mm -hmm. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And as I understand from Sherry Pugh, who was one of our, our partners at that time, this was the second wave. This was not the first time that the mortgage crisis had adversely impacted. And I remember, uh, you know, looking, Cura had uh, the, the Center for Urban Research. Urban um, and Regional Affairs. Re Urban and Regional Affairs. Mm -hmm. They had done some research and I said, well, has anybody looked at how this is going to impact putting, you know, doing this renovation of a building. The houses are closing around us. The community is disappearing and we haven't had any discussion. So we held a session on campus uh, that, that got about 90 people, including representatives to come. And then people wanted to continue the conversation. So we began to use those monthly community affairs meetings to have further discussions. And that led us to a research, a community driven research project on looking at the impact of the mortgage foreclosure on individual family and community health and what we did was to hire community people as researchers mm -hmm. and i advocated to pay them the same wage as the graduate student who was working with us that took some doing people weren't accustomed to that but it was the beginning because and and then the idea was that the, the research meeting was open to anyone. We couldn't pay everybody, but anybody could stop in. We held it every Wednesday, uh, you know, at a certain time for a couple of hours and anybody could drop in and they could learn some of the, 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 the research techniques. We were teaching people how to do content analysis. Uh, that is look at, read the newspapers and then extract from them the key points. We were teaching people how to design surveys. I did the initial survey and then we would discuss it and people would have questions. We taught people how to do face-to-face -face interviews. And we actually did a survey of some of the local businesses who would say to the community members, because you're doing this survey, I'm going to tell you what I really think. If someone who didn't look like you came and asked me those questions, I probably wouldn't answer them as right. in depth as I would. So if they began to, if at all. Mm -hmm. And so they began to understand sort of the value. But also research is translatable skills. You can take this content analysis and you can now look at the papers that you're getting from your child's school. You know, what is it really saying? You know, these are what the words are, but is there something else that they're trying to communicate or not communicating? You know, uh, you could do a, a simple survey with the teachers, you know, be, you know, how do you formulate good questions where you can get the information you need? So we saw these skills as transferable and translatable, but the key was that there was equity in that research process that the people who were community people, all they needed was a high school literacy uh, because it was a lot of reading, but they didn't need a college degree to do the work and that they would be paid exactly the same as the people who were the, gra the graduate students. And that was someone, someone told me later that not all the programs were doing that. And they, they realized uh, after we had completed it, how transformative and innovative and <coughs> unique unique that that was and equitable, you know, and so when we talk about equity, we have to understand that it means putting people on parity with each other, that you recognize that the community comes with its set of strengths and the, the, the researcher comes with their strengths, but that you have to see each other within, as, as Dr. King once talked about, mute, you know, webs of mutuality, that we have a common interest and a common goal that we're trying to accomplish. And so we have to have respect. I come with a, a, a knowledge base that is very rooted in the community. And you may come with a knowledge base that's rooted in theory, 
But at the same time, we're trying to put them together to come up with something that is going to be actionable, workable, and sustainable. The other feeling that uh, Brenda was referring to, she's heard me say it a number of times, that uh, from the memory of Plymouth Avenue as a war zone, as a wasteland, to the witnessing of its redevelopment, even though it was delayed uh, with the townhouses on Plymouth Avenue, and those have been maintained fairly well uh, in places where in history, you know, townhouses like that would be viewed as projects which would be expected to deteriorate and uh, have a deterioration of the quality of life for the residents that hasn't happened so much on Plymouth Avenue. That, and even with the creation of the fourth precinct as a new building with community space now with the uh, UROC, uh, all of that anchoring uh, expansion and creation of the new uh, Urban League building on the corner of Plymouth Penn, that then leading to the uh, redesign altogether of Plymouth and Penn as a hub of economic and cultural and social and educational activity in North Minneapolis. In a sense, the re-establishment of Plymouth and Penn as the center of urban uh, thought and urban development in North Minneapolis, in the Black community. Right now, you have uh, what we call it the Thor Building, but it's called the uh, Urban, uh, what's it called? Uh, there's a formal name for it, uh, but it was developed by Richard Thor on the corner of Plymouth and Penn, just uh, east of Uroc. And then across the street from there, across the street on Penn Avenue, the new Estes Funeral Home, which had been uh, on another side uh, but that was taken by uh, the expansion of North, North Point, Point yeah. Health and Wellness. So right now we've got a phenomenal uh, investment, I think probably upwards of $60, $70 million in new investment on the corner of Plymouth and Penn, maybe going north of $100 million in time. And all of that uh, creates the sense of vitality and a sense of possibility. So when I drive up Plymouth Avenue, this is what Brenda was talking about, I would look to my left and see the parking lot full at Uroc. And because the windows are glass, I could see you know, 30, 40, 50, maybe hundreds of people engaging each other inside the building in the large community room and in the, the corridors of the art gallery, yes. visible. And you see this energy and it's infectious. And then if you keep going another block, you look on the right side, uh, it's not as uh, accessible to the eye as Uroc is, but you could see activity at the uh, Urban League. Yes. Uh, Glover Sudduth Center, parking lot full, people meeting about the business of community. Now, just across the street, just to the south, this massive uh, Thor building. Uh, and I'll think of the name of the building. It's called the... Um, like an innovation center. It's not, that's not okay. the name of it. It'll come to me in a minute. But uh, I love calling it Thor in honor of Richard Thor, Richard Copeland, owner of Thor Companies that built yes. the building. Uh, so you see meetings happening there, people going in and out of there. And additionally, now uh, uh, the SS Funeral Home serving its purpose with, with yes. dignity and with beauty and with elegance and professionalism. And now the new access, the new drive in access to um, North Point Health and Wellness and North Point uh, Community Services coming online in a matter of days. It's a brand new day in North Minneapolis. And I think that you and UROC uh, as visionaries and doers uh, have uh, uh, should take a lot of credit and a lot of pride in what you did and what you brought. I was you know, I was, to go say, ahead. You can envision this, this little lady over a table with the architects beginning the beginning. And, yep. and, and, and what is even more? So when I think about you, Rock, I, I was very well aware of the way in which North Minneapolis was characterized in newspapers, in real estate magazines. And I actually called one one time and said, are you aware that the university is 
is is has purchased a building and is renovating it for two <laughs> eight million dollars. And they were like, no, I said, well, you keep writing about North Minneapolis. Have you been over there lately? And they had not. And so it was using my privilege to bring to their attention. So that was one piece. But I kept thinking about you, Rock, and I think the architect, sir, and even the construction company, they got it. I wanted to set it as a standard that mm -hmm. anyone who came in North Minneapolis after would have to at least meet that as a standard or do mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And I think the Thor That's building right. is much better, yeah. you know, yeah. but I think that you rock set the standard. They have a museum on the first floor. Yeah. Would that have happened if you rock had not had an art gallery, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing where, we all, all I had was a $2.8 million budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and I couldn't go over it, but in that 2.8 million, the architects were, were very, very savvy and, I'm, I'm, and, and gave us their all because they believed in it. And they now go looking for projects that have community engagement in it. The construction people, do you know that most of the offices don't have doors. We say $15,000 if you don't put a door in. But oh, wow. Stahl Construction came in and said, well, come and see our offices. So what they built were these huge doorways that were like eight feet tall, but the desk was around the corner. So you had a level of privacy. So mm -hmm. the only thing that had uh, doors on it were like conference rooms. So if people needed privacy, there were right. places they could go. Right. We have a meditation room in there. Mm -hmm. We have a facility that if you need to take exam uh, samples for health stuff, the way the bathrooms are designed there, they have the little, you know, the little uh Thing where you can put the sample in and then mm -hmm. it can be taken from the other side. Mm -hmm. All of that within budget. We also had DNA portraits done. There is original DNA portraits done by a local artist who's now living in DC, Lynn Feldman, who partnered with Juxtaposition Art to take on two apprentices. And she actually had community people people who worked in some of the nonprofits do the DNA samples. And then she, she photographed them. She sketched them. She took their oral histories and those portraits are unique. Those portraits have traveled around the country and they were actually at the North Carolina museum of natural sciences, you know, and the genesis for that was you rock because what I wanted to do with those portraits was to give something back to the community, you know, that we were giving something that was a gift back because it tells a story of community people. And the other one was the TPT uh, documentary called Cornerstones. The concept for that was mine and mm -hmm. some of the background research, but it didn't get made until after I had left. But Cornerstones, it's like, how do we tell the story of North Minneapolis? So that's mm -hmm. another one, that little documentary tells the story of, I think it's North High and people who went through there. And it sort of looks at iconic buildings like the library that's there, North High and some other places. And so it looks at space and how those spaces tell stories about the various communities that have come through North Minneapolis. So there's that so much. That UROC building is important to me personally and to Insight News and this program, the conversation, because we actually started this yes. enterprise in that building. Uh, on the west end, that build, west end of that building was a restaurant called Lucille's Kitchen. It was That's the, right. the second occupant. The first occupant was a J.C. Clark Pharmacy that lasted several years and then uh, didn't. And then uh, Henry Sullivan and Louise uh, Williams, sister and brother, uh, had business uh, doing food and they bought and built up Lucille's Kitchen. After a while, I would bring my staff up there on Mondays or Tuesdays to do our weekly editorial meeting and talk about issues in the neighborhood. Tables next to us and away from us will be listening into our conversation. We'd say, pull up a chair, pull your table over, let's talk about the neighborhood. That is what evolved into a partnership with KMOJ, first of all, ah, then yes. KMOJ and KFAI, then Time Warner uh, Cable Television, uh, then SPNN Television. But that was the creation of, at uh, first, the Insight KMOJ Public Policy Forum, which okay. became 
conversations with Al McFarland over a period of time. The partnerships included the Minnesota uh, Public Radio, uh, included uh, the Star Tribune in projects and others. Uh, and we did things like uh, video conference uh, town halls connecting, say, scholars in North Minneapolis or community activists in North Minneapolis with uh, legal scholars in South Africa yes. to look at the truth and reconciliation hearings that were closing in South Africa. We had another panel that looked at HIV AIDS, the pandemic among Black people in North Minneapolis and then South Africa's treatment of HIV AIDS and other STDs in their population. We did conversations between Lucille's Kitchen, North Minneapolis and Crookston, Minnesota. Uh, how do white people in rural Minnesota look at the city? How do we look at uh, the farm community? And these programs included people like Jesse Jackson, uh, Al Sharpton, uh, Paul Wellstone, uh, obviously the mayors and, and governors of our state, uh, Keith Ellison regularly, right? Uh, Mayor Sharon Sells Belton, but it was a place that helped build this identity of North Minneapolis as a locus, a, a location where uh, our community expressed its ownership, its point of view around public policy concerns. So I think we still are moving in that arena. We have to do more of it. This is the latest iteration. Yes. But thank you for all that you did to help bring it online. And I would say, Al, I hope that you will go back to Iraq and, you know, when you start doing more things live, because I remember the interviews you used to do at the global market, yep. right? You could you could have some of those where you're broadcasting on site, you know, mm -hmm. and you've got this energy of people walking back and forth yep. and trying, you know, and, and listening That's to what's going idea. on. And I think that that would be a great site to, to bring it. And Sherry Pugh reminded me, that one of the things that, that the architects and the construction people did in Europe was to respect the history. Mm -hmm. When they were doing the grounds, Bob Close, who's an environmental landscaper, they found peace post that had, you know, had been a, a, a time when there were some peace walks mm -hmm. in North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and they were there on that site, and they maintained those. Mm -hmm. There's a sculpture, there's a wire sculpture of a horse. We're not sure where it came from or whose it is, but they maintain that. And then, of course, that chimney, you know, that stack, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. still has some of that artwork. And mm -hmm. so there was an attempt to, to really continue to embrace the local history, the community's history, you know, uh, in there and opening it up. That was something that I learned from talking with uh, the Native American uh, Redevelopment Organization. And she said, if you want to reduce crime, you don't close it down. You don't pull down the shades. You actually open it up because if people can see in, there's less likely, you know, to be people are less likely because they can be seen, they're highly visible. And so I intentionally did not get blinds and shades because I wanted the, that transparency that you could look from the front of you rock to the back oh, and from amazing. the back, people could see into the front. Yes, yes. Amazing. Yeah, Al, so there's a lot the, of intentionality. You would say that once Dr. McLaren finished, you had a headache, but it was a good headache. There we go. I mean, yeah. She yeah. just articulated a case study that could be a book. You know, it's uh, that's unbelievable. Who would think of the shades and and burglaries and stuff? I I can't believe it, Doctor. I I'm done. I hope <laughs> I know and, where and, I'm And also, tell, but <laughs> also, it was it was like office size. I had people coming in and saying, "Well, I want this much space." And so I talked to the the person who did space management. I said. Is there a rule in the university that if you have a certain title, you have to have so much space or a certain kind of space? And they were like, no. I said, make them all the same size, including <laughs> your office, including my office. Now, the executive director's office has pocket doors, so you can't see them because everybody else doesn't have a door unless it's like a conference room. But there is a sense of privacy because when you look through these tall doors, you usually are looking at a window. And then the desk has a level of privacy because it's behind a wall. And that was something that Stahl Construction told us. You can save $15,000 if you do those doors, you know, no doors. Who knew? Who right. Knew? And then at 15000 the other thing that we did that I'm so proud of, because I know we're running out of time, mm -hmm. is that 
the university's rate for women minority business enterprise inclusion was something like about 12 to 15 percent we set ours at 30 and according to stall i just looked at their stall construction i just looked at their website and they have something about uroc on it they hit 38 percent. so 38 percent of all the subcontracts that came out of uroc went to women minority business enterprises there we go listen we're out of time irma what i didn't get to i want to do this at another program with you uh i love talking about your uh, journey uh, in uh, the world and in academia and in public life. Uh, you uh, knew personally some of my heroes, among them uh, James Baldwin. And yes. I can't get enough of hearing you talk about the time you spent with uh, you know, my uh, hero, James Baldwin. But you travel. You've uh, written stories to us about your time in Belize and you've communicated and submitted Suriname. stories in South Africa yes. uh, and other places. So I want to come back. And also your career as an educator. You're a former president of a university. That's phenomenal. I want to talk about that. We'll do that at another time. Uh, enjoy the day. I Thank will. I that. will. Thank you all. It was great talking to you. And I and hope to see some of the listeners at let's, 4 o'clock at UROC. Let, let's plant the seed about getting the conversation live again at UROC when you're there today. Take care. Absolutely. Okay. Take, take good care. Good pictures, Dr. Irma. Yes. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.